colleagues, friends, associates, members of federal and state parliament, members of the judiciary, members of the Australian Intelligence Services, <laughs> And everyone here interested in the protection and enhancement of freedom of speech and freedom of information, I welcome you to uh, this event this evening. My name is Spencer Zivchak. I'm the president of Liberty Victoria, one of a number of independent non-governmental organisations who have come together to organise this forum this evening. This event is an enormously important one and it's especially significant for two reasons. Firstly, as far and as far as I'm aware, this is the first occasion on which the director of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, has agreed to address a public forum in Australia since the first release of the documentation on the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war which commenced now almost seven months ago. And the second reason is that we remain still at the height of efforts by Western governments, including the United States and, sadly, the Australian government, to silence WikiLeaks and its director. The preferred method chosen to close down WikiLeaks and to deter its director is for governments to threaten the organisation and him with prosecution for serious criminal offences. This is despite the fact that even after six months of intensive lawyering both in Australia and in the United States, no charges, not a single charge, has yet been laid in relation to the WikiLeaks disclosures. And more than that, no law has yet been identified either in the United States or in Australia precisely anywhere under which a prosecution may be pursued. This attempt to silence WikiLeaks is plainly and patently at least in the Western world, the most momentous free speech issue of our times. The threat of legal proceedings is clearly central to the actions and events which now swirl around us in relation to WikiLeaks and the furore that it appears to have created in governmental circles. For that reason, I'm particularly delighted that our first speaker tonight will be Jennifer Robinson. Jennifer is an Australian lawyer who is currently working in London on Julian Assange's legal team, defending him in extradition proceedings which commence this coming Monday, and more generally advising him in relation to possible avenues of prosecution that may be launched, if they can find a law under which to do it, in the United States. So Jennifer, we're enormously pleased that uh, you're with us this evening on Skype, and uh, we invite you to address this meeting. Well, it's a great pleasure to make this beautiful Melbourne, Julian's hometown, and WikiLeaks hometown, just days after WikiLeaks nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for its work in promoting peace by holding governments accountable for their actions through the disclosure of information. WikiLeaks' publication of US cables revealing Ben Ali's corruption and nepotism in Tunisia is said to have contributed to the protests and the Jasmine Revolution which saw him removed. In Egypt, WikiLeaks' cables demonstrated that torture was widespread and accepted police practice by the dictator Mubarak when I last saw Julian, it was at the height of the demonstrations, just after Mubarak cut off internet and mobile phone networks to quell the protests. 
Julian and his team had been up all night reducting cables in order to send them into Egypt by whatever means they could. At the time we had joked, what kind of a world is this that we live in when the, United, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, is quick to accuse Julian Assange of being a high-tech terrorist and yet is reluctant to call Mubarak a dictator? Just a few days later, Mubarak was forced to resign and President Obama, himself a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2009, called for swift political reform. Closer to home, WikiLeaks cables have confirmed what West Papuan refugees living in Melbourne and human rights lawyers like me have long claimed. The Indonesian military is committing widespread human rights abuse against the indigenous Papuan population while being paid at the same time to provide security to US mines, Freeport. Questions were raised by the Indonesian parliament. However, as it has done with East Timor in the past, the Australian government continues to turn a blind eye to this abuse, occurring just 300 kilometres north of our shores. But the WikiLeaks cables documenting this fact makes it harder and harder for governments to continue to deny that it happens. WikiLeaks has made a remarkable contribution to free speech and the operation of democracy by providing the public with information to make better informed democratic choices. In recognition of this work, earlier this week, the Sydney Peace Foundation awarded Julian its prestigious Human Rights Award. Previous recipients of the award include Nelson Mandela and the Dalai Lama. In my opinion, all Australians ought to be proud of our latest homegrown Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And yet, despite these international accolades and achievements, both Julian and WikiLeaks are constantly accused of illegal activity. Certainly, it's politically easier for politicians to accuse them of crimes and putting national security at risk, rather than to deal with the content of the cables, which reveal their own abuse of power and corruption. I myself was shocked at the initial out, uh, release of the WikiLeaks cables when the Australian Attorney General McClellan announced that Julian would be handed over to the US authorities swiftly and that he would not rule out revoking his passport. When Julian told me this news, I couldn't believe it. I had to read it for myself. Would the Australian government be so quick to turn so unquestioningly on its own citizen and leave him stranded abroad without constant assistance? Apparently so, sufficient political power was brought to bear. We had serious conversations at that time about whether Julian would have to become the first ever political refugee seeking asylum from Australia in another state. Soon afterwards, Prime Minister Gillard, in what I consider to be a breathtaking political and legal miscalculation, accused Julian of acting illegally. Of course, the Australian Federal Police later proved her to be wrong, and the Australian public will not forget that. But she was not alone. Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, the Bank of America have all shut down donation payments to Julian and to WikiLeaks on their alleging that their activities are illegal. The US Attorney General Eric Holder has initiated a full-scale criminal investigation scrambling for ways in which they can prosecute Julian. At present, he faces investigation by a US grand jury for alleged breaches of the Espionage Act. But what is it that Julian and WikiLeaks are doing is illegal? Is it illegal? And the answer is no. Anyone who has spent time working with journalists and media organisations as I have knows that investigative and political journalism operates on leaks. Disgruntled bureaucrats hand journalists documents because they feel they ought to know what the government is really up to. Journalists receive and publish that material to give voice to the story and to communicate the message of public interest to the public. It may have been the greatest leak, the largest leak in history, but the US cables release is in reality no different. WikiLeaks, along with its media partners, The Guardian, The New York Times, De Spiegel, Le Monde and El Pais, received government documents and published them because they believed that they contained material that was in the public interest. As editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, Julian is, like the editors of each of those media organisations, entitled to the free speech protection of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. If Julian is to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act in the US, then so too must each of the editors of those, those newspaper organisations. Thus, any criminal prosecution of Julian for the publication of the US cables puts at grave risk free speech protections for all media organisations, both in the US and around the world. While Julian is an editor of a media organisation, 
wikileaks stands out for the additional protection its technology provides to its sources as i said earlier journalists receive and publish material all the time and in return they have an obligation to maintain the confidentiality of their sources as a media defense lawyer i understand well the importance of the protection of journalistic sources and how legal protections for those sources are inadequate the world over in australia and elsewhere journalists can go to jail for refusing to identify their source wikileaks provides through technology rather than the law better protection for, this, for these sources by providing a high security and anonymous dropbox in this way the identity of their sources are protected and the entire point of wikileaks is that the identity of their sources cannot be traced the value and indeed the legality of what wikileaks does is demonstrated again by the fact that other mainstream media organizations such as the guardian the new york times and al jazeera are now replicating wikileaks dropbox model but while the U.S. scrambles to find a way in which to prosecute Julian for publishing his cables, he, faced, he now faces extradition from the U.K. to Sweden to face allegations of rape and sexual molestation, allegations which he vehemently denies. But because of these allegations, in December, Julian was arrested without charge in the United Kingdom, pursuant to a European arrest warrant, and kept in solitary confinement for more than nine days, and since that time, under house arrest while we have been preparing his extradition proceedings, which will be held in London on Monday and Tuesday next week. It is important for the public to remember that the hearing on Monday and Tuesday is not a trial of the facts in which the court will determine Julian's innocence or guilt in relation to these allegations. Instead, it's a technical hearing about the validity of an arrest warrant and whether the UK should comply with Sweden's request that he be forced to return to Sweden. In many ways, I wish it were a trial of the facts because I'm certain that an English court, or indeed an Australian court, would throw this case out. It is, after all, a case about consensual sex between adults in which neither women said no. In fact, any reasonable prosecutor, both in the UK or Australia, would have agreed with the Chief Prosecutor in Stockholm when she decided to throw the investigation out. As a woman and as a feminist, I believe that all allegations of sexual assault must be taken seriously. But we do not achieve justice for women by denying justice to men. It is clear that Swedish prosecutor Marion Nye has acted in contravention of her obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights. She is simply not giving Julian a fair go. For many months, she has refused to inform Julian of the allegations against him. It wasn't until we stood in a police station here in London and Julian was handed the arrest warrant that for the first time he saw the allegations made against him in a language which he understands, which is English. Our investigations have shown that this prosecutor has ignored key exculpatory evidence in her possession and refuses to disclose to us that evidence. She has rejected his voluntary offers of cooperation and instead sought an arrest warrant that has seen him kept in solitary confinement and under house arrest. This, is, this has caused great disturbance to his work for WikiLeaks, of course. We will be arguing in court next week that the prosecutor has abused the European arrest warrant system. Julian has, of course, continually offered to cooperate with these investigations. Both in Sweden, he stayed in Sweden for more than a month in order to clear his name, and subsequent to that time, since being in London, we have offered on numerous occasions to answer the questions of the, of the prosecutor via video link from the Australian Embassy, from Scotland Yard, and through other means. The prosecutor has, has alleged that she is prevented from doing so by Swedish law, but we have proven in the past month that this is an absolute nonsense and that she could have used mutual legal assistance. Instead, she opted for an arrest warrant that has seen him kept in solitary confinement and under house arrest. In this context, there is much that the Australian public and the Australian people can do, as well as what the Australian government can do to assist Julian and to assist us with his defence to ensure that he can continue his good work with WikiLeaks. We call on the Australian public, public to donate to WikiLeaks and to his legal defence fund so that we can assure him the best possible defence. We call on you to urge the Australian government to seek assurances from the Swedish that Julian will not be returned to the US should he be returned to Sweden and instead will be allowed to return home, which is his wish. Finally, we would urge the Australian government to ensure that proper legal procedures are followed so that Julian can fully clear his name of these incredibly damaging allegations and continue his important work for WikiLeaks. Thank you.